Good morning, friends. I hope your morning's starting out well. For us here at home, we're, uh, I'm on a sleepy kind of morning today. I could just curl over and go right back to sleep, that's for sure. And uh, Sausage is here with me. And Sausage is in a needy kind of morning, so if I seem distracted, it's because I can't sit here uh, without him sitting next to me and just licking me and licking me until I give him some love. So I'm going to give him some love as I talk. Now, we're continuing our story of Solomon's life in 1 Kings, and there's a lot that's happened. Um, you can go back and you can read through some of these chapters if you want. We're going to begin in chapter 9, but the big thing that's happened is Solomon has continued this work of being a wise and a good king and of building the temple and making um, treaties with other nations. He's not a particularly warlike king at all, but he manages to find other means of peace. Um, and one of the things that Solomon does is build the temple. Now, having built this great, big, beautiful temple to replace the tabernacle, which was, of course, um, a, not just a French cuss word. It was also a, uh, a big tent that had many different layers where the Holy of Holies was and where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. So that's replaced, and indeed the way that they build it, it imitates, the temple imitates the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, but we're not going to go into that. That's not what this is about today. Today, though, so after the temple is built, Solomon prays first for God to enter the temple, um, to make it his own and to continue his relationship with his people, and God answers that prayer. And in front of all the people, God's presence enters the temple with all of his holiness, and he tells them, you know, and... Um, What's the word that I'm looking for? And then there's this great big celebration. All of Israel is celebrating. It says uh, it is close to the brook from the brook of Egypt to the uh, from the brook from Lebathathan to the brook of Egypt. And for seven days they're celebrating. And so Solomon throws this magnificent party because God has you now the temple has been finished. This is a a matter again of national identity, a matter of something that. God had told that David had dreamed of, that God had told David he wasn't going to be the one to build it. He couldn't be the one to build it because of the blood on his hands. And now Solomon, the son of David, has built it. And all of Israel is celebrating because, remember the tension with the high places, because now there is a place to worship God that is their own. And they don't need to go find a big tree on a mountain to worship God or any such nonsense. So now we come to chapter 9. And this is Solomon's second theophany, Solomon's second meeting with God, second appearance of God in Solomon's life. So Solomon gets uh, is very privileged in a way to have these moments. Um, in fact, really, when we think about it, and this is what it's going to build up to, Solomon is given everything that a person can ask for. He's given godly wisdom. He's given all of the material blessings. He's given um, rule of a kingdom. He's given God whose presence is with him. He's surrounded by people who can point him to God, good prophets and good priests. And he uh, has God himself speaking to him in these visions. Something that I'm not even, I don't think there's any recorded moment when David had this happen in his life. David spoke to God through prophets, whereas Solomon God appears to Solomon personally, which is pretty intense. So let's, we're, that's what we're going to look at today, is in chapter 9, God meets with Solomon and makes a covenant with him. So let's take a look at that. As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel, but if you turn aside from following me 
you or your children, and do not keep my commandments or my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them. And the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. And Israel will become a, a proverb and a byword among all people. And this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss. And they will say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worshipped them and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. And that's the covenant that God makes with uh, Solomon. And you'll notice that it's a continuation of the Deuteronomic covenant, the covenant that God made with the people of Israel and Moses, and it's a continuation of the covenant that God has made with David as well. There's nothing particularly new about it. It just now has a locus in the temple. There is also a, an increased tension because now it's this comparison between the heart of the king and the heart of the people. If the heart of the king goes after God, then the people are led in that direction. But if the king turns his back on God, if the king goes to idols, then we should certainly be expecting to see the people go the same direction. And that's what happens here to begin with. God's addressing um, Solomon, and he's saying, the way you do will, rule your, will determine your house, whether you and your sons follow me. But then by the end of it, there's this smooth transition into reflecting on God's judgment as having been poured out on all the people of Israel for them turning their backs on God. And it really bears witness to us that uh, the heart of the king reflects the heart of the people that are there. Uh, in the same light, the Lord, uh, the when the king does right, the land is supposed to be blessed as well. So when a king is just, remember that uh, line that David spoke, that beautiful line that we should all remember? He says, a king whose, um, whose heart is after God is like a... Um, I remember it's like a gentle rain on a field, and it's like a um, a morning sunrise. So a king who's good becomes a blessing. A king whose heart is after God becomes a blessing to those that he's, who serve him. But a king whose heart is for the, the idols of this world leads a people who find themselves following after the same idols. So there's the tension that we see being developed, and that's why this book is called Kings. It's because... By looking at the kings of Israel and Judah, we're going to see how their hearts led to the downfall of the nation, as the nation as well was led into idolatry through them. So it, the book of Kings, I'm sorry if I just gave it away, isn't exactly a happy book. But First and Second Kings really do tell us an amazing story of God's faithfulness in the midst of all that. And that's why we're taking this journey together. Now, for our text today... Um, what's true for Solomon here is true of us. God has made promise after promise to bless us. He's made a covenant with us in Christ, a covenant that can never end. But that covenant has tangible aspects to it, um, of God's blessing, of his presence, of his joy with us. If we turn our backs on the covenant, if we turn our backs on worshiping God, even Christian, even Christians, even saved Christians, when we turn our backs on God, um, we reap judgment instead of reward. And that's something to think about, as well as the simple fact that, you know, if you can easily turn your back on the, the holiness of God, the glory of God, and the worship of God, then you should really begin asking yourself questions about, if that's easy for me to do, am I truly saved, or is this just a cultural identity for me? Do I truly have a lifelong relationship with the living King of Kings? So that's where this text brings us. It reminds us of the responsibility that we have as we lead, and it reminds us of the grace of God, and uh, it prepares us to see the fall of Solomon in the next few chapters. Now, uh, let's take a minute to give thanks, since, of course, um, that wasn't just for yesterday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your power. We thank you for all that you are doing on our behalf, for the way you love us and the way you care for us. We thank you for your spirit who dwells within us, for the wisdom that we can ask for and we receive from you. We thank you for the way you reveal yourself to us through your word and through your son 
and through the community that points us to you, as well as that still and quiet voice that speaks within our souls. We praise you, Father, for um, the word that we have today, that you are a God who chooses to dwell in our midst. And um, Lord, I'm so thankful that we don't have to journey to some temple in Jerusalem to draw near to you, but that your Holy Spirit makes its home in our hearts. And we thank you for Christ who has made that possible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence and thank you for your wisdom. Father, we look out over our world today and we recognize a great need for wisdom. We recognize a great need for a people of peace in a broken world. And we ask, Father, for your peace to dwell in their midst. We ask, Father, for your peace to, to lift up those who are brokenhearted. And we pray for your church that you would give us that purpose and that where we are divided, that you would help us to become one, centered on the love of Christ, the sacrifices of Christ, and the joy of seeing his kingdom enter into ours. We pray, Father, as we approach the Christmas season, that you would give us humble hearts, thankful hearts, and hearts that are generous as you are generous. Ultimately, Christmas is a reflection of the generosity of God who gave his only begotten Son, and Lord, we recognize that uh, there's nothing we have that has even a 1% a, a of the value of what you have given for us. So Father, we pray that you would meet us where we're at today and help us to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving and a heart of generosity before a broken world. We pray, Father, for those that are hurting and those who are battling with cancer. We pray for those who are recovering from surgeries. We pray, Father, for the many that we can think of who are mourning today, and the many, many more who we don't know, but we know of the mourning and the loss that's happening around the world. As the world mourns, Father, we pray that the, the presence of Christmas and your Son as an answer to death would bring hope to our hearts. We pray, Father, for your uh, guidance as we, as a people, Walk humbly with you. Give us wisdom today. As a church, give us wisdom. As um, leaders, give us wisdom. As uh, parents, give us wisdom. To, to lead well, to love well, and to proclaim the gospel in Miramichi and wherever we are. We pray for safety for our family members. We pray for salvation for those that don't know you. And we pray, Father, that you would be glorified in us and through us today and in the days ahead. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining me today. I hope that you have a beautiful day and a wonderful weekend. We'll see you on Sunday at 10 a.m. at the service, or you can just join us on Facebook. God bless you all. Bye-bye.